Hello. People. Yeah, I get those videos going. Wow, where is everybody? <laughs> it's not even midway through the semester yet. Wait another like minute or two. There we go, people trickling in. Yay. And welcome to the new student. I will not call you out by name, but I see you. Welcome. Okay, let's start because we have a long PowerPoint. Everyone see and hear me good? You see power, um, canvas behind me, hear me good? All right, thank you so much. If ever anything cuts out or the audio or anything, always just let me know in the chat. Okay, am I recording this? Yes. All right, as usual, let's go over real quick. What do you have due? Because you do have something due on Sunday. It's your first quiz. I'm sorry, I do have to give them to you. 10 questions, hopefully. Not too painful. You have 90 minutes to do it, but it shouldn't take you that long. I hope it doesn't. Um, yeah. And like I've mentioned before, you will immediately get your grade, but if you are trying to figure out the correct answers, because it doesn't display the answers, you can email me directly, or um, the answers will be released next Saturday, something like that, because of the late dates. And if ever you have a question about a quiz too, please like, if you just say number four, that doesn't always help me because there's a bunch of questions and you all get randomly assigned questions. So if you could copy the question, that would be helpful. Or screenshots, I'm all about the screenshot. Okay. Do y'all have any questions, comments, concerns about what I expect from you over the next week? Okay. Let's get rid of that then. And let us begin. What format is the quiz? Um, do you mean like on Canvas? It's just a Canvas quiz, like. No, I cannot. You have to come in, but I can tell you afterward. Uh, they're all multiple choice for this quiz, uh, but in the future, some of your questions are going to be um, fill in the blank, like computational stuff. But for this one, it's just all multiple choice. And Elijah, if you want, or I think you go by Eli, actually, if you want more info, stay after class. You have to come in on time. Okay, so let's get going. So today, we've talked about all of our independent and dependent variables. Great. And that's more of research experimental design, which is very important. And I hope that you all take a research methods class one day and get more, get more in depth with that. But now we're going to talk all about the different types of measurements and the types of data that you can have, because there's actually quite a few different types. And it's going to be very important to know these when we start working with data in R, because there's some things you can and cannot do with certain types of data. So let's get into it. Why is it flickering? Okay. So what is a variable? Remember, it's something that varies. Um, there's also things that are variable, which is the verb and the adjective. We've already kind of talked about that. So here are some things. Let's just start with some kind of easy things. Give me a measurement. How tall are you? What's your rank? How much do you weigh? How old are you? How much formal education do you have? These are all fairly easy to answer, right? Thank you for the head nods. I am looking at you all. Okay, this is still flickering. Do you all see that? I'm very sorry about that. I think it has to do with OBS right now. Get your stuff together, OBS. Sorry, that'll drive me a little nutty and I don't want to give anybody a seizure. Okay, so these are all fairly easy to answer, right? The only, like maybe there's a couple things you'd have to specify, like somebody get in the researcher mindset. What is something in all these that maybe you'd have to specify? Any one of them, because these are, there you go, very good, the unit. You know, are we talking about American standard or metric? Um, maybe like with formal education, what do I mean by Formal. Does that mean like being in a school? So like kinder, does kinder count? You know, that kind of stuff. So these are all fairly easy, right? 
Now, give me a measurement. How intelligent are you? How creative are you? How confident are you? How happy are you? How statistically literate are you? You will be more at the end of this class. So, these are all more conceptual, right? This isn't a simple, like, bust out a ruler, measure something, right? These require some conceptualization is what the word is, but we have to kind of define all of these terms and then we have to figure out how are we gonna measure them? So, just throw a couple at me in the chat. I'm gonna give a little bit of time, I'm gonna wait. As you all know, I wait. Somebody throw like a kind of a definition of what, any one of these, like how would you define any one of these concepts? Let's start maybe then actually with, um, let's go with intelligence for right now. Like what is intelligence? Don't be shy, give me some answers. And I will wait. Okay, here we go. The ability to grasp concepts and to build upon them. I like that. And we have, somebody said IQ, which is almost a little bit cheating. Uh, problem solving ability, good. The ability to understand things. I mean, these are all really good. Like we would assume somebody who's intelligent can do most of these things, right? But then the problem would then be, well, actually, here are some of the like definitions I find online. Intelligence is the ability to acquire, and the other important like aspect there is and apply some knowledge. Uh, creativity, the ability to think and create new ideas, confidence, self-assurance arising from one's appreciation of one's own abilities. Everybody work on that self-confidence. It's very important in life. Happiness, feeling, or showing pleasure, contentment, statistical literary ability to understand and gather, analyzing, blah, blah, blah. So here is like the concept that at least, we still don't know how to measure it, right? But at least we can all kind of agree that, okay, your definition and my definition of intelligence or creativity is pretty much the same. So we're talking about the same thing because there's different types of intelligence too, right? Like there's, I guess the general intelligence. Some of you who've maybe taken some psychology classes, they've talked about the G factor or something, not just being a G, but like some sort of overall, I guess, general IQ. But there's other types of intelligence too, right? I have a lot of, uh, what do you all call it? Like liberal arts and humanities majors in here. Tell me what other types of intelligence there are aside from just, I don't know, doing math or something. Other types of emotional intelligence, very good. Why is this not taught in schools at a young age? Yes, what else? And emotional intelligence most certainly is not usually what we're thinking of when we think of people who are intelligent. Any dancers in here? There was one last year. Kinesthetic uh, intelligence is another one. It's your ability to basically know kind of where you are in space and how to move your body. I mean, very intense athletes have that and dancers, things like that. So there's a lot of different types of intelligence, but let's say for this case, we mean the ability to acquire and apply knowledge. Still a little bit vague, but at least we're all kind of getting on the same page. So this whole thing, when you take some sort of vague amorphous concept and you conceptualize it, that's what's going on here. We're basically giving it a definition that again, you and other researchers or whoever it is you're talking to that you all can agree on what you all mean by that word. All right, so we've conceptualized. Now what do we gotta do? Cause what is the whole point of this class and with data? and all that, and research. We need to go and take some measurements probably to go and test hypotheses and to go and figure stuff out. So how do we go from a concept to a measurable thing? What kind of steps do we need to take? What kind of questions do you need to ask? And this varies, of course, depending on what the concept is, like intelligence versus creativity. There's a lot of different things going into these. So the next step after you conceptualize something, if any of you are ever going to do those human, what is it, um, honors thesis or anything like that, or if you want to go to grad school, this is something you're going to have to think about. Because for example, myself, I wanted to study fidgeting. I'm interested in fidgeting. Okay. First off, what does fidgeting include and not include? There was another person who made a fidget scale and they said that um, like peeling the label off of bottles was a fidget and for my definition of fidgeting, for my definition that I, the way I op, uh, conceptualized it was any sort of rhythmic repetitive behavior that doesn't serve any other immediate purpose. 
but to me it has to be rhythmic and repetitive so like again like the jiggling the pen the twirling the hair all of these things are done again and again this kind of peeling thing is to me not the same and that's my definition and fidgeting doesn't have too many definitions so i could write my own basically this is how i'm conceptualizing it but then how do i operationalize it i want to measure fidgeting okay well first i have to figure out what type of fidgeter maybe you are like the leg jiggle like am i how would i measure the leg jiggle actually i want to know how i want to just study leg jiggle fidget i don't have a necessarily a specific question what kind of things could i measure thinking about people with their jiggly leg you see one out in public. What can you measure? Shakes per minute. Nice. You could use like an accelerometer. Very good. How many times the heels touches the ground? So that's like basically, like basically how long does it take to complete a cycle? Good. There, I like that one. Uh, how many times they do it in, within a certain time frame? So when I was working as an ABA therapist, um, we would try to teach kids things like colors and functional skills, but sometimes we had to do the, uh, the type of suppressing of like not so good behaviors, like uh, self-injurious behaviors. Sometimes they would hit themselves or um, some kiddos would just kind of make like a really loud high-pitched noise all the time. Like there's just certain things that we didn't want them to be doing. And to, like a tantrum was one that we would also track. But Tantrum is kind of hard because a kid, I'm sure you've all seen one, they freak out, maybe flop to the ground and scream and kick. And then maybe they kind of calm down and they're starting to like get up again, but then they get upset again, they do it again. Like how, how are we gonna measure that? Do we measure how many tantrums they had? Do we measure the duration of it? And it all depends. Like um, with certain kiddos, if one kiddo was very prone to having a really long tantrum, we would track the time. If some kiddos were um, maybe doing a, a self-injurious behavior where they would just hit themselves a couple times, we would maybe track the tally and how many times it happened. Okay, so back over here, operationalizing is when we have to figure out, okay, we have a concept, self-injurious behavior means hurting themselves. Let's define it whenever the hand comes in contact with the head, because some of them would do that. We have to define it, so because there's multiple therapists on one kiddo's uh, program so we have to make sure that we all agree that this is what we're gonna count not maybe this or maybe not this or some other behavior it has to be exactly this so we all are measuring the same amount or the same thing so that's operationalizing it and tallying it so let's do one together how could we measure creativity give me some ideas how can we go about measuring a person's creativity I hope you all can't hear that swallow noise. I'm sorry if you can. Ink blots, all right. So ink block tests, Rorschach tests, I mean, they're not really used as much anymore, but they were definitely used back in the day and they were usually more of trying to kind of tap into what you feel and think about certain things. They're kind of poo-pooed nowadays. Projective tests is what those are called. Activity in parts of the brain, okay, that is really intense and expansive. But here's another question for you. I love neuroscience research. I'm taking a Python neuroscience class right now. And when I started really learning what neuroscience really, like what they're using to come up with all of the explanations, like fMRIs and EEGs, and these things all sound really intense and you see these beautiful rainbowy pictures of brains. Oh my God, those things are not nearly as refined as you think. There's a seven second delay with fMRIs so there's no time resolution. And with EEG, there's no localization. You get really perfect timing, but it's, you don't know where it's coming from in the brain. So if you have like a brain and like a little part lights up, like is that them being creative? Are we gonna force them to do a creative task and see what lights up? It's hard to tell. How many original ideas one can come up with in a time span? I like that one. Could be artistic or slogans. Good. So that, thank you, leads us perfectly into this example. Here is a brick. <laughs> if we were in class, I would make you all probably just write it all down. I'll give you like a minute, but this time I'm not going to. Just want you all to throw some things at me. Here's a brick. Tell me all the things you can do with it. Be creative. What can you do with this brick? Throw it. <laughs> that's always one of the first things that people say. Doorstop. Yep, that's another one I've heard. Put it on your head, break a window, sit on it, paint it, and build a house. 
All in that order. Just kidding. Good, good. Paperweight, build a fence, bake something in the holes, stand on it with one foot, use it as a step. Hey, I'm getting some new ones here. I like to put it on your head. <laughs> Wait. I have a brick on the head. Oh, God, my legs are sore. A planter, nice. Use it as a step. TV stand, Might be a little dangerous. Eat it. Don't eat the brick. Do not eat the brick, okay? Break it into pieces with a hammer. Steal it from Speedway. Just a little memento to remember for yourself from grad school. You could do that. A utensil drying rack. I've never heard that one before. I like that. A toothbrush holder. I like it. Man, I swear, I'm not blowing smoke up y'all's butts, but this is the most creative class I've had so far. Some of them are a little bit put in someone's backpack. I mean, it felt like that when I was in college. I would carry all 10 books, and now I don't buy books. Sew it a sweater. <laughs> Just make a little, like, nice, cozy little sweater for it. These are fantastic, y'all. Put it on a leash and keep it as a pet. Pet rocks were a thing. Just drag it with you. Just say you're doing, like, a workout, but it's really your pet. I cannot read that. I believe that's Korean. <laughs> there we go. An umbrella dryer. Man, you all are, and give it a little hat. Oh my God. This is great. I am very impressed. Still think we should give it a name. All right, somebody named the brick. Can't just keep calling it the brick. Doris. <laughs> I don't know why I love that word. Brock. Hey, Brock the brick. I like that. All right, Brock the brick. Great. Very good. I, I loved all that. We're going to stop for a second. Um, normally people say kind of the same, I like doors too. Normally people say come, kind of some of the same things like a doorstop, break a window is very common, or I think one time somebody said send a message. I was like, yeah, that'll send a message. Um, hit someone with it, you know, different things. Somebody once said a test tube holder. So two of you, utensil holder and a toothbrush holder, pretty good. Somebody else said, um, was it grind it all down and make a powder with it? I don't know why you'd want to do that, but I don't know. And uh, one of my personal favorites, and it was from, because I've given this example thing, I've taught like kids from like two all the way up to like 65. So I've had a lot of different people that I've tested this on. And uh, I think a group of high schoolers, one of them said, you can cover it in frosting and pretend it's a cake and give it to somebody as a prank. And I was like, it's pretty creative. <laughs> Okay, so we had all of these really fun, wonderful examples, but now here's a problem. How do you score that? How are we going to score that task? Are we just going to count them all? Because we're testing creativity, right? And if you said things like breaking the window, uh, building a house, like some of the more common things you would do with a brick, pave a road or something, I mean, these are technically not that creative. That's what you're supposed to do with a brick, right? So do we count just how many? Does it matter if it's super original? And what if it's just really far out there? Like, and it doesn't make any sense. Like, um, well, I was gonna say like, just draw on it. Well, I don't know, that's kind of creative too. So here, this is just emphasizing the problem that we don't really know how, it's not obvious. Many things, especially in psychology and sociology and more of the, I guess, not hard sciences, but even hard sciences have a trouble with some of this too. You have to figure out how you're going to measure it. What percent of them are related to violence versus household use? That would be an interesting one. Like, you know, we had those ink blot tests back in the day, the Rorschach tests, and you might say, oh, I see a murder scene or something. Like, that would be like, ooh, maybe a little signal. Goodness, these allergies. A little signal that this person thinks a certain way. Um, but yeah, you could ask them, if they were to say something household versus something violent, maybe we could kind of try to categorize them as certain peoples, but that's getting into personality and that is a whole nother can of worms that a lot of people love personality assessments like that Myers-Briggs and stuff. And I've had to take graduate courses on that stuff and I personally do not like it. I'm not into it. I know we all love to hear about ourselves and hear about what kind of people we are. And even I have made scales about fidgeting, but I'm always like, because when you really see what it comes down to, it doesn't seem as like, I don't know, solid. That's just me. If you do personality stuff, you do you. You enjoy that. That is your personality. Okay, so time to operate. That's such a 
grainy picture. Uh, just throw a couple at me really quickly because we are already going too slow, or I am. Pick one of these. Health, anxiety, extroversion, personal space, type A personality, statistical literacy. How would you conceptualize it and how would you operationally? Basically, how would you measure it? Pick whatever you want. Just somebody throw some stuff at me here while I continue to wipe my runny nose. I am so sorry. So BMI, uh, oh, for health, okay. Can measure body mass index, that's a good one. But even BMI, as a side note, has a lot of issues wrong with it. It doesn't necessarily uh, take into account certain types of body types. And it also changes as you get older and younger, I believe. What else we got? Ooh, look at that. Somebody is saying not just health, but overall mental health also, physical, psychological well-being. So this is a much more holistic -y kind of thing. Personal space, the amount of space somebody feels their body takes up and distance away from the body. Extroversion, time with others. I'm so sorry for all the extroverts out there during times of COVID. Okay, that's pretty good. I normally would wait longer, but like I said, we need to kind of go quickly. So the one that I find really interesting is this personal space one. So it's probably kind of hard to tell on some of your computers, it might be too small, but here is a person. Basically it's an aerial view. And we have, can't see it very far either. We have intimate space, personal space, social space, and public space. And it's giving you actual like meter distance to kind of give you an idea of where that boundary is. But, I'm gonna hide this line right here. But what is this also very dependent on? Is this true for everybody? This, I mean, obviously not, people have differences, but um, is it true for all groups or all type of person somebody is, right? There's like individual differences. Who here is a uh, Latinx? I have a few. Uh, who here is maybe like, who's more austere? German or something? Yes, thank you, cultural. I mean, if you go and meet an Italian, they're kind of like, and Israelis too, they're very up in your face and very warm-blooded. They get offended if you don't argue back with them, it seems. Not everybody, of course, but one of the stereotypes. And some cultures are kind of like, no, 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 we don't get that close to each other and people just keep on approaching. So this is very uh, culturally dependent. But this is a really cool example, in my opinion, of turning something that's fairly abstract, this idea of personal space, this is my bubble. How do we quantify that? How can we measure that? And you, that one's a little bit easier in that, well, you can measure the distance, right? And so it wasn't just this idea of, my space is kind of here. Well, I could actually get a measuring tape and measure that. So that one's a little bit easier. Okay, so, and also with that personal, uh, personal space example, you could have asked somebody to describe their idea of what personal space means to them. Or you could ask them where in space their personal space begins. So what is the difference between these two questions that you could ask them? What is the difference between this part and kind of this part? I'm getting some data out of them, right? Yeah. Thank you. That one is qualitative and one is quantitative. So what does that mean? For those of you going, what? I've never heard that word before. That is okay. Because we're talking about quality versus quantity or qu the quality of quantity. I don't think that's supposed to be an of, but whatever. Forgive me. Okay. So we have qualitative data, which if you think about just the way it's broken down, it's the quality, which... It's not exactly, it doesn't mean that that's better quality than this one, but I'll show you in a second. And quantitative, like the quantity of something, kind of like countable things. So these are basically real numbery things, and these are not so numbery types of things. So let's start with this one. What is this? Describe it and measure it. Give me a few things. once now. 
It is an iconic painting, this is true. It's made up of various colors, good. Leaves in it are green, we have some qualitative stuff, you can de describe that. A painting, yay wide and yay tall. That, how tall and how wide, what kind of data is that one? Kind of data is a certain amount of inches, certain amount of inches. Is that going to be qualitative or quantitative? Quantitative, good. We also have one monkey, a portrait of a woman, includes many organisms. Uh, and everybody answered the quant part. Good, so you all are giving me two types of data there, right? And so here's some of the ways you could say like, it's a portrait of a woman with necklace and enamels and uh, there's thorns piercing her neck. She looks kind of solemn. It feels kind of intense. It's pretty. <laughs> um, it was painted by Frida Kahlo. Holler. I think this painting is still at the Ransom Center, by the way, if any of y'all actually want to go and see it. I still have not, and I am very guilty. Then we have some quantitative stuff. There's not as much. I mean, it's a little bit harder to quantify a painting, but maybe the year it was painted, or how many years it's been since it was painted, or how old she was when she painted it, or how many hours it took to paint it. And here is the yay tall and yay wide, the dimensions of it. So there's some numbery things we can get out of it, but you see the difference that one of these we can get numbery things, and one of these is describing the qualities of something. But the colors used be quantitative. The only way I can think of that being quantitative is if you think of, um, was it 255 as the number of, or 256 really, the number of like lumen colory thingies. Like, you know when you have to pick a color and you can pick like the wheel that has all the colors kind of? That actually has a number associated with it. But if that, it's also a question of, is that number, well, hexadecimal is another weird world of numbers. It's base 16 instead of base 10, but I don't want to confuse everybody. But yeah, the, you can kind of think of color in a number of ways, and this is getting really technical, but if you think, well, every color is comprised of a certain wavelength of red, green, and blue, and if you measure each one of those, you can get something quantitative about it. But for the sake of this class, so nobody gets confused, color is always going to be some sort of a qualitative variable, like red, blue, green. Okay. <clears throat> so some of the pros and cons, like qualitative data is really rich in information, like human behavior. You can get a lot of details in there, like observations and interviews. Every time I'm telling you all... Um, little anecdotes about my experience with ABA or research, like that's a lot of qualitative information. And using qualitative information, you can analyze certain themes, but it can sometimes be hard to quantify and reproduce. So some people start with qualitative data, maybe at the beginning of a big research project, they're trying to get long feedback and responses from people, and then they're gonna go and look at all that and see what the commonalities were. So for example, I could have asked, instead of asking people the 10 fidgets that I noticed, I could have just said, how do you fidget? And they have to report back basically a word to me, which is useful at the very beginning, but as you will see in the future, hopefully when you start working in R, what the hell do you do with all that? Like even if somebody said leg jiggle, but one person spelled uh, jiggle with a capital J, the other person a lowercase j, R would not know those are the two same things. So you would have a whole bunch, it'd just be a big mess. But there are ways that you can code all of these kind of word things. Or another example I used to like to use is how you could study um, like advertising throughout the years and see how many times advertisements were very uh, sexually suggestive, like drive him wild or whatever. Every time they say that, you could like kind of tally it. And that's how you can quantify qualitative data, but it's tedious. Like people who do qualitative research sometimes are kind of like looked down on as not like real researchers, but I give them a lot of respect because that takes actually a lot more effort. And this is a, usually the stuff that's interesting to look at and read. But then quantitative, they're like concrete numbers, measurable, usually reproducible because if you think the average length of a hognose snake is five feet, somebody else can go out and validate that by measuring another snake, and it's easier. Um, you can also run statistics and perform analyses on these numbers a lot more so than you can with these. You can still do some statistics on categorical qualitative data, but not as many usually. And you can do summaries and tests here. All right. Variables and types. 
before I even start this, I still sometimes get confused with some of this because you're like, well, is it, I mean, if you think of it this way, so there's like exceptions. And when it comes to this stuff, um, like for your quiz questions, I try my best to make them pretty obvious. Like I don't want them to be interpreted different ways because a lot of these answers are, it depends on how you look at it or how you treat it. And that's kind of common in research. It, they will treat it differently to suit their needs sometimes if it's appropriate. So I'm sorry in advance. Sometimes you're going to be like, but isn't it? It's like, it could be, but again, for your quizzes, I'm, I'm usually trying to make them fairly obvious and not too uh, ambiguous is the word I was looking for. Oh, wait, I didn't even talk about this. Okay, so we have a variable, and a variable can usually be sorted in one of two ways. We can have qualitative, which we've already talked about that, and quantitative, and then it kind of goes down. <coughs> this categorical part is a little bit redundant, but I like that there because I usually end up calling a lot of qualitative things. We're going to talk a lot about categorical data and categories like male, female, uh, redhead, brunette, black hair, whatever it is. And we have these different categories. We're going to go through each one of these except the binary. It's a special case of categorical, but I'll talk about it in a second. And discrete or continuous. And that just means, does it go on forever or is it each individual units? Again, I'll talk about this in interval ratio. So it's just a quick little overview. We're going to go into each one of these ad nauseum. I'm sorry. I hate, I hate this part of the lesson. I'm sorry. But it's important. So again, qualitative, we have, the, you can also think of it as categorical. We have nominal and ordinal. And quantitative, we have either discrete or continuous interval ratio. And here's just another visual if it helps. I mean, I just threw a couple in here to help you all as much as possible. So let's start with the categorical qualitative kind of data. So What's in a name? A rose called by anything else would be still still as sweet. Is that how it goes? Sorry for those of you who are English majors. I apologize. Um, so here we have our very first category is nominal data. Those who know Spanish, what does this mean? Where does it kind of sound like? Nombre, exactly. Perfect. Nombre means name. So that's kind of where this word, uh, this name co comes from. So nominal data is really just think of it as like name or label data. So it's purely a name or a category. It can differentiate between items and subjects in that way. Um, it's qualitative in nature, kind of limited math stuff. You can do some math things, and we'll see those at the end of the semester, actually. It's usually used as a kind of grouping variable. So again, like males versus females, or Republican versus Democrat. Um, here's an interesting little thing that I want you all to pay attention to, because I don't want you to get tripped up by this. You can assign numbers to a category, but these are like not real numbers. So the same way that the letter A can be like uh, A, B, C, D. I could have also done 1, 2, 3, 4. But adding A and B or adding 1 and 2, and those are like options, doesn't mean anything. Or also like your ID number, right? Well, I guess at UT they give you letters in there too. But at my old university, it was just a full number. Or your social security number. like. Would it make any sense to take your social security number and like subtract somebody else's secure social security number? Give me some nods here. No, right? Because that's not a real, it's not a numbery thing. It doesn't really represent a quantity. It's more of just a different name. Instead of using the alphabet, we're using digits. But so in this example, males versus females, I need to cough one second. <coughs> <coughs> So with males versus females, instead of writing male, female, male, female, um, you can do that, and that's fine, and R can handle things like that. But in the background, R is actually going to recode these things into factors. We'll talk about that later. And we would say, OK, all males, instead of having to write the word male every single time, I'm just going to write a 0. And for all females, I'll write a 1. But again, this 0 and this 1, are they like real numbers? Do they have numberiness to them? No, you can just think of them as some sort of a symbol. Like it could just be A or B or something like that. Um, the most that you could do is that you could count all of the zeros and count all of the ones, but like you can't really like, what, would, what sense would it make to do like female one minus male zero? That doesn't mean anything. So these are all just namey kind of things. The most mathy stuff you can do with it is just count them. But they are just names, categories, labels. So 
So here is another example. These are like valueless numbers. Well, some of them. Which of the columns above are examples of nominal data? We have subject ID, gender, and age. Which, if any, are nominal variables? All right, good. Got a little bit of stuff all over the place, but most people are saying subject ID and gender. So gender, I just gave you the example. This is male, male, female, male, basically. And these are ID numbers, and there, it would make no sense to add 103 to 345. Like, you can't do real mathy stuff on it. It's just a label. Instead of saying Jill, John, Mary, and Joe, I'm just giving them numbers instead. And this is very, very common, especially in, um, in like medical research, or pretty much all research. You usually, try and you, need, you usually need to anonymize your subjects. You don't want you know, anybody's full name anywhere, so you have to usually give them some sort of an ID number so you can still keep track of them, but it's not directly linked to their name. And yes, age is a real number variable because we could take 19 minus 15. This person is four years older than that person, and that does mean something. This is an example of one of your quiz questions, by the way. Everyone's now like, huh. Oh. So here are some more, and it's pretty endless. There's just an infinite number of these probably. So like gender, color, car model, major in college, language, religious affiliation, which handedness you are, the type of fidget that you normally do, true, false, yes, no, correct, incorrect. Those are technically, um, those are like binary variables too. Like those are technically all kind of categorical things. It's like a state or a label, an indicator. Okay. So I was saying the kind of one numbery thing you can do with categorical data is that you can count it. And so this is called a frequency distribution. So first, let's just look at what we have right here. I'm giving such a terrible shadow. So right here we have, let, let's pretend that I asked a bunch of people what their favorite color is, but these were the options. Or maybe, this, maybe they just reported this. So brown, black, white, green, blue, purple, whatever. And then here, I'm just tallying it. So every time somebody says brown, write another tally. Every time somebody says blue, write another tally. Then at the end of my research, I add all these up and I tally them all up. And so I have the frequency. How frequently did I hear brown? How frequently did I hear black? So we have two, six, one, everything. So I want you all to understand that this was the option. This is how many times people said it. And that's just translating the tallies into proper numbers. So now that's all well and good, because we can quickly see that the most common or favorite color was, what was everyone's favorite color? Red, yeah, and that's great. I mean, we have the wrong numbers. But now, like, what's another question we could ask? I mean, I kind of mentioned this one of our first um, classes, that I like to see the raw N, the number, and what else would you maybe like to see? Like, if I just told you 18 people liked red, is that a lot? Is that a little? We need to know the sample size. And what can we do then with that sample size? The percentage of red. Very good. So that's the next thing that we can do. With the frequency distribution, we can also figure out the relative frequency. What the heck does that mean? Relative to every other answer, red got 24%. Relative to all the other answers, purple got 23%. Okay, and the way that you do that is you just take the frequency, the total number of that particular color, and you divide by the total sample size, which in this case was 74. And then you just do that all the way across. I can't remember, but I do think that there might be something like this on a quiz. Now, some of these things, it's like, well, duh, like, Getting percentages, not that big of a deal. We sometimes do that in life. Uh, but I think what tri trips people up is that now we're using words like frequency and relative frequency, and we're eventually gonna see frequency distributions. So just don't let that trip you up. Already asked you that. 24% chance. Okay, so here we have two graphs that look, they should look 
pretty much exactly the same, but I think one is just zoomed a little bit more on accident. But what is the difference here? The shape of it is exactly the same, but what's the difference? What are we plotting here? Thank you. Raw numbers versus the percentage. Okay. Little nuance thing, but these we're going to talk, I think, in the next period or the second to the next period uh, about visualizations and keeping an eye on what these axes are is very important. You're also going to make some graphs like this, some bar graphs, or in this case, these are frequency distributions, not histograms. You're going to make stuff like this for your R assignments. And it's going to be beautiful. And no, you're not allowed to use Excel. Although I do admit there are some things that even us codery folks, if I can call myself that, that sometimes you're like, oh, I know how to do this in Excel really quickly. I don't know how to do it in R, so you'll do it in Excel. But you can't always, especially with really big data sets. Like the data sets I work for with Dell, Excel won't even open them. They're too big. OK, so we talked about nominal. Just remember, nominal, nombre, name, it's just labeling categories. <clears throat> Basically, if you ask somebody a question and they respond with a word, that is categorical nominal data. Now we have get in order. So ordinal data, what does it sound like? Things being in order. So in this case, <laughs> don't worry about Excel, use R. <laughs> if you're going to spend any time learning anything. Um, so. This tells you the rank and order, and you can basically sort everything. The most important thing that's going to differenti differentiate this from the next one that we see is that the difference between first place and second place is not the same distance between second and third place. We know that first place was, let's say, in a race faster than second place and faster than third place, but do we know by how much? No. This is really just in order. So we could also put everybody in order of height, right? But um, and we know who is taller, but we wouldn't know by how much, and the increments are going to be different. So here, let's say I had a, one athlete, maybe a basketball player. Sorry for the stereotype, but I mean, it's not completely off. So let's say I had somebody who was like 6'7", and they were my tallest student, and I then put everybody else in order. So this person is, let's say, like a, a whole foot taller than the next person in line. But then the next person from there is only an inch of difference, and then everybody else is like a centimeter or an inch, and it gets much, much smaller. So notice that the difference between the first person and the second person versus the second and the third person, they're not the same length, or they're not the same interval is the word we're going to start using. OK. Another example again. So like, we're going to know who was first, second, and third, but first, one over second place a lot more than second place one over third place. So again, the interval, these are like the differences in like time or distance, whatever you want to measure it. That's the, they're not all the same. This is the defining thing that's going to separate this from the next category that we look, or the next type of data that we look at. Likert scales. A lot of people say Likert, but apparently it's Likert, which is even weirder. I'm sure you all have used one of these at some point in life, whether at the doctor's office or for some sort of a survey, or if you've ever written a survey, this is very, very common. I mean, I use these two. They're very, very useful in psych psychology and other sorts of fields where you're measuring these conceptual things or very uh, mentally psychological things. Uh, social science research, that's what I was looking for. So these, you can impress a professor in the future, but be very careful how you do it. These are technically ordinal data. Why is it ordinal? I mean, here's the answer, but why is this ordinal? This is me hiding the answer, not just being weird. Very good. Y'all are getting it. Exactly. So if somebody strongly disagrees and then, or it's the other way, strongly disagrees and then disagrees, like, is this really the same little, God, I look like I'm near a fire. 
All right. <laughs> is that really the same amount of intensity from, from disagree to strongly disagree as it is from like disagree to neutral? I mean, we want to believe that, right? But eh, we don't really know that for sure. So again, technically it's ordinal, but <laughs> researchers tend to use, take some liberties, and they will treat this as the next level of data we're gonna see here in a minute, which is interval. And the reason they do that is because you can do more mathy things on it. You can do more stats on it. And it's kind of a thing that everyone goes, yeah, yeah, we know, but shh. <laughs> Nobody even really mentions it in their papers, but it is totally a thing. Okay, here are some other examples. So school rank, like the ranking of a school's program, percentile rank, hotness rank, famousness rank, creativeness rank, Likert scales, socioeconomic status, like high, medium, low. They're technically like categories, but these actually have some order to them and level of agreement from disagree to agree. Okay, so that is all of like the qualitative -y stuff we're gonna talk about. Does anybody have any questions there or any confusion? Okay. Now on to quantitative data. So quantitative data can be either discrete or continuous. And this is also confusing because then how does it relate to interval ratio? Never mind. So discrete, the way that you can tell if something is discrete or not is it's basically a fixed set of options and finite number of choices. You can't cut things into halves. You're not gonna get a decimal. And some examples of this are the number of laptops or cell phones you have, unless you're one of those tinkerers who takes your things apart and have a whole bunch of broken apart cell phones or something. But most of us have one laptop, one cell phone. You don't have one and a half cell phones. The number of cars you own, you're not gonna have two and a half or 2.38 cars, really. And don't get nitpicky here on me. Um, the number of significant others in the past, <laughs> probably whole numbers there. So continuous data, uh, conversely, is like infinite number of values technically. So it's like decimals and you can keep on like zooming in and getting more refined. So, refined. so we have like, I'm gonna talk in, yeah, I'm gonna talk in metric. So we have kilometer, and then we have like a meter, and then we have like a centimeter, and then I forget the number of meters, but like, like nanometer and petometer and all these kind of things, and that's the other direction. But you know, you can keep going and going and going and going. So even though it's, what time is it? It is 417 with 35, 36, 37 seconds. I can also say how many milliseconds and how many Mm, I need to know these. There's like another, you know, it can just go on and on and on. Basically, you can always zoom in and get more refined. So you can keep on cutting it up. So like age can be calculated technically to an infinite level. Like when I wrote this PowerPoint, I was 33 years, one month, four days, seven hours, 12 minutes, 45 seconds, so many milliseconds, so on and so on and so on. Here's an important little detail. So continuous variables can sometimes be discretized at the discretion of the researcher. It's a little bit of a joke, a little bit of a pun. But what I'm saying is like, here we have 33, one month, whatever. Like we could also measure it in months. We could measure it in days. But for most research, like I don't need that level of refinement. I'm okay with just 33. And we're just gonna put you into a bin. I don't need you to be, I don't need to know every single detail. So we're just gonna put you in a discrete age bin of 33. Okay. This is not the best example. Don't look at this one. Okay, so with this interval data, so we just talked about discrete versus continuous, and I'm pretty sure interval and ratio data can be either one. Yes, I still get confused. Nobody's gonna ask you these hardcore questions in life, but you do need to understand the data that you are working with, what can and can you not do to it mathematically and statistically? That's why it's really important, but the way that these things are presented in textbooks is very like nitpicky, and I'm sorry. Interval data, the first example you always see is temperature. So with interval data, remember I said with um, ordinal data, we know they're in order, we know it's going from least to most, it's called monotonically like increasing or decreasing, but the differences between people are all over the place, they are different. In this kind of data, they're, they're the same, basically. So when we're talking about from two degrees to three degrees, or from 92 to 93 degrees, that one degree change is one degree. 
It's the same one degree at the bottom and the same one degree at the top. It's not like a logarithmic scale or something. Um, but the ratios, this is a little bit confusing, the ratios, how many times a number is contained in another number, are not meaningful. Um, and what's really more important here is the zero is arbitrary. So this ratio thing relates to, does it have a real zero? Now, what do I mean by that? Oh, first, sorry, um, is 80 degrees twice as hot as 40 degrees? So when I'm saying the ratio is not the same, 40 degree, or 80 degrees is not twice as hot as 40 degrees. I mean, it seems like it is, it's doubled, but the way that temperature works, this is not true. It's not twice as hot or cold, whatever. Why not? Again, because Celsius and Fahrenheit do not have a real zero. And also, I mean, if you just think about it, um, with Celsius versus Fahrenheit, you have two different, hold on there, Jason, you're jumping the gun, but yes, very good. Um, so they have, Celsius and Fahrenheit both have a zero, right, somewhere. But is that the complete absence of heat? Those of you who have ever lived up north, I one time went to Poland and was like, why do people live like this? It's so cold. Top it off, I was in Auschwitz too. It was just like, God, I'm so sorry. This is so bad. So yeah, there is definitely, it can get more cold than zero. So it's not a real meaningful zero. So that's called an arbitrary zero. Here's another example of like an arbitrary, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to offend anybody if you are, you know, a Christian. Like it's technically for everybody like an arbitrary zero point because zero, or we're in 2000, my God, we're in 2021. Uh, that is 2021 years since the birth of Christ, which is a relevant date to some people, but as far as all time, that's not the beginning of time. There's, it's not BC anymore. What do they call it? What are they called BC now? I forget. Does interval data fall under discrete or continuous or is it sort of freestanding? I believe, and I'm sorry that I'm not completely sure on this and this lesson always gives me anxiety. I believe that it can be either, uh, just depends. And we'll, like a lot of the examples I'm giving you right now are discrete though. Well, yeah. But I will not ask you a question like that, um, Alexis, so don't worry too much about that. I know it can get a little like, well, because there's exceptions to a lot of these things. That's why there's not these hard, strict rules. And if you look online for examples of this, like when I was building or making this PowerPoint, I want to teach you all truth and I want the answer. There are conflicting answers. If you look on all these blog posts and stuff, like people are saying two different things. So it's kind of like, eh, it depends. And again, the point with all this understanding what kind of data you're working with, it's so you can work with it appropriately. If you just had a whole bunch of categorical data, you can't do a t-test, for example, and we'll see about that later. Arbitrary zero. So there's most certainly time before year zero. Other types of interval data, IQ scores. Does anybody know what the average IQ score is? It was most likely set up this way. <laughs> oh, ye of little faith. <laughs> it's actually, it's 100. Yeah, it's 100. And most likely that was standardized on there. So that hump, what we're going to see in a second, like 100 right in the middle, that could probably slide back and forth. Like, why the hell is ACT double digits? SAT is three and four four digits, GRE is three and four digits. I don't know about MCAT and LSAT. Like all these stupid tests, I hate standardized tests. I'm sorry, they're very interesting in how they're made, but I had to take the GRE like three times, screw that. So all these different things, they have, um, they have the equal intervals, but what are these things missing again? Like IQ score, here's one that most people don't think about like, can you get an IQ score of zero? I know you've met people who you think have an IQ of zero, but can you get an IQ score of zero? I'm seeing some head nod or some head sh shakes. Yeah, no, you can't. Excuse me, I think the lowest that is really there, I think is, I'm not even sure. I mean, maybe 40s, 50s, 
Like to get a zero, you would probably have to be non-responsive, you know, like comatose, and that's just completely inappropriate to try to give someone an IQ test. Has anybody taken an IQ test? And I don't mean one online, I mean a real one. No? Just a quick segue, or a side note. It's not a segue, it's a side note. Um, I had to give out IQ tests for my first clinical psychology degree I gave. They take like five or six hours. It's very painful. Some people are like, I have 130 IQ. I took a 10 question test online. No, there's no validity to that. But IQ tests also are kind of, actually, you all tell me, what do you think are some problems with IQ tests? You all don't know too much about them, but what can you think of maybe are some problems or what are some um, complaints and criticisms you've heard about IQ tests? Cultural barriers or just culturally biased, absolutely. They don't test all types of intelligence, very good. My goodness. All right, I'll read this one out loud. Everybody is a genius, but if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will live its whole life believing it is stupid. <laughs> I like that. Albert Einstein, apparently. I hope that's a proper quote. Um, they all test different areas. Good, and yeah, the fish would die. So real quick, IQ tests. I thought I had it somewhere, but I think I took it out of the slides. It is comprised of anywhere between, I think, 10 or 12 to up to 18 little sub-tests. And you're gonna get one big score at the end, but you're also gonna get two smaller scores that make up the one big score, and it's called performance and verbal. And so verbal kind of makes sense, right? What do you think verbal is? It's gonna be stuff with words, but there'll be things like, um, what do a table and a chair have in common? Now what's funny is that everybody for the most part answers first the legs, the leg thing. But hold something. So what's funny too is that um, if any of you are gonna go into clinical uh, psychology kind of work or you do assessments, um, you have like this book, this grand book. So if somebody said legs, you would normally, there'd be like a little cue, because that answer is in the book, because they know how common it is. There'd be a little cue, and then you're supposed to query, and you're supposed to say, can you tell me a little bit more about that? To try to get the answer out of them, because maybe they didn't get the right answer, but like they're kind of close. The DSM-5, I worked on 4TR back in the day. That's how long ago my clinical psychology degree was. I do not have five anymore, or yet. So the commonality, is that they're furniture. They are both furniture. Be and like the four leg thing is kind of like, mm, like, or legs because you could technically sit, you know, on a, I don't know, a block and it could be a chair. I don't know. Um, how about this one? This one always drove me nuts. What do a, a friend and an enemy have in common? These are real IQ questions, by the way. Just the few that I remember. Very good, they, it's you. You are the thing that is in common between them. Yeah, that was another very common answer, like it's a type of relationship you have with a person, but the answer is you, they have you in common. Um, there's other questions like block design, you have to give them a little thing of blocks, they have to mimic it, that's for spatial stuff. There is, what are the other ones? Uh, there's some where you have to use your working memory and I would go seven, three, D, to B. And you have to recite it back in alphabetical and numerical order. Or you have to recite it back just perfectly right. Or recite it back backwards or something. Yeah, they don't seem like serious questions. It gets better. <laughs> Some of the questions, there's 30 and it's called general knowledge. You have 30 questions to judge your IQ. Some of the questions include, what is the Quran? the Islamic holy script. Who is Catherine the Great? These are all real questions from at least the old version. I'm sure they've changed them all now because people like me killed test security. She is dead, this is correct. <laughs> but, anybody know who Catherine the Great was? Look her up, she was a bad bee. She was the Tsarina of Russia and her stupid husband died and she ended up taking control and everybody loved her. 
Um, there's one other one. Oh, how many people are there in the world? What's the world population? Today, roughly. I like that these numbers can be all over the place. I've had people before just say like, what? I mean, I don't want to be rude, but like 500 million? And I'm like, the U.S. has like 350 million the last time I checked. So, I mean, no. I mean, India and China each have a billion on their own. So, yeah, it's about, at this point, yeah, it's about 7 billion. But you'd be surprised. A lot of people don't know that. It might even be more at this point. 7.8, is that a looked up number or a guess? If anybody wants to look it up, that'd be fun too. Anyway, so there's just a lot of weird questions that you're like, does that judge your intelligence? Also a lot of questions about like, what does this word mean? And some simple kind of math things, not really anything intense, but just things that you're like, is this really testing my intelligence? I don't know. Anyway, that was a side note. Uh, so what else is interval data? Calendar year, as far as like our, oh, 2021. Uh, degrees of temperature, as far as Fahrenheit and Celsius. Likert scales, remember, they're technically ordinal, but they're treated as though they are interval. And I don't think I ask you in a quiz, but if I do, the answers at the end of this PowerPoint, we'll get to it. And ratio data converted to a standardized metric. Um, don't worry about that too much. 7.6 billion people, according to Google. And it's only going to grow faster and faster and faster. So now we're to our ratio scale. So like we've been going from like, no, I'm not going to keep describing it that way. Never mind. Ratio scale. This has equal intervals and it's all in order. Uh, but this time the main difference is that it has a true absolute zero. So yes, JT, <laughs> you were correct. There, there's one type of uh, temperature that is actually a ratio scale and that is Kelvin. And I know I don't have too many hard science students in here, but can impress all your friends by knowing the Kelvin scale. Kelvin is a scale that it's also a temperature scale. And here it is like related to like Celsius and stuff. But there is such a thing as a zero. Fun fact, we've never actually reached that zero point because, does anybody know what that zero actually indicates? Because like when we're saying Celsius, if I say it, it's zero degrees out. Does that mean that it's, there's like the absence of heat? And I know it feels like there's no heat, right? Especially if you're from Texas. Yes, exactly. Zero Kelvin is literally, like, because heat actually comes from molecules doing this all the time, if you think about it. But if everything is too cold, they basically stop and they stop moving around and they basically like freeze in place and there's no movement anymore. And again, we've never actually gotten any sort of, because you can't do this just naturally on Earth. You need some sort of an instrument or some sort of device to try to make it that cold. And I don't think they've reached it yet. But who knows? I mean, did you all see this headline that I think somewhere in Japan, I forgot where, they've created something that was hotter than the sun? Like just created some like big giant furnace that was hotter than the sun. Okay. Many hard sciences have ratio scale data because there is some sort of a true zero. And this is. This is a little bit confusing. So right, if I were to ask you, what's your favorite color? And you said red. It's like, okay, then I ask you, what's your favorite color? Red. Okay, two people said red. So if you just respond with the free answer, which is red, you respond with a, a name, a nominal category, I could also at the end of the day tally all that up and actually have a count. And countable qualities with zero is a true possibility, like zero people could have said they like red. That is considered ratio. Um, anything else I need to say here? So really, whenever you're trying to figure out, like maybe on a quiz question or more importantly in real life, if this is, you know, if you're trying to figure out what to do with your data, ask, is there a real zero? Because if you can't, like a lot of those um, happiness inventories or uh, depression, Beck's depression inventory, things like that, they might have a zero, but a lot of them don't. Or like self-confidence, like, can you have zero self-confidence? And some people would say, yes. But as far as measurements go, you probably kind of can't. So does it have a real zero is the defining feature between interval and ratio. And here are a bunch of examples of ratio data. Uh, age, weight, income, years of your education, the number of minutes from a certain time point. 
So from the beginning of class to the end of class, it's an hour and 15 minutes. The number of hours you study. Uh, time since the Big Bang might be okay. Like again, this is why I'm like, it depends. It depends where you're kind of looking at because it is possible that there was something before the Big Bang. Was there time before? If there's nothing moving, is there even time? Let's get philosophical, but no. And here's more of this uncertainty. So sometimes scales of measurement are easier to distinguish from others, and sometimes they're not. So if I were to say year, well, you'd be like, well, since when? Since my birth, 33. Since uh, Jesus' birth, 2021. I think Chinese calendar is different too, since the Big Bang. I mean, it depends. Um, and some scales are treated differently when it's justified for certain purposes, like the ordinal data being treated as interval for those social science things. And so in life, a lot of it depends. And I even one time argued successfully with one of my teachers. She gave us a question that said, uh, what kind of data is blood pressure? What do you all think? What kind of data is blood pressure? It doesn't matter if you know exactly how blood pressure measured, it's fine. What do you all think? Nominal, ordinal, interval ratio, blood pressure. All right, I have one vote for ratio. I'm gonna wait till I get at least five more votes. Two ratio. Y'all ain't gonna be penalized for guessing incorrectly. There's not even technically a correct answer here because it's debatable. Ratio, since weight is also ratio, have one for interval, one for ratio. Thank you, now I have enough responses. But y'all, <laughs> I was in my class today and the teacher was like, okay, what do y'all think, A, B, C, or D? And like, I'm a person to answer. There's about 20 people in there. One other person answered and she was like, I'm gonna wait until I get six responses. And it was quiet for like three seconds. And she was like, okay, never mind," And just kept going. I emailed her and I was like, no, you wait. She's like, it was awkward and uncomfortable. I was like, you get comfortable in that silence. You make them work. You make them engage, right? Y'all are loving that I force y'all to engage. Yes, thank you, Alexis. So that was my point. So the teacher said that I got it wrong because I wrote ratio. She thought it was interval. But then I said exactly that. Can't you have zero blood pressure technically if you are dead? And she was like, well, yeah, I guess so. And it's one of those things, like if you argue your point and with the quiz that I give out, I used to tell people if you can argue the point to me and like it makes good solid sense, maybe I'll change it. It just depends on the interpretation. But uh, unfortunately you all have gotten, you're getting this quiz after I've already given it to a few classes. So I've weeded out all the questions that were kind of ambiguous. So most of them are, have a correct answer. All right, so some clarifying questions when you're trying to figure it out. If it's a question like what do you like or which is your favorite color, it's probably nominal. If you're saying something like how many, it's probably interval or ratio. And if you can have zero of that thing, it's interval instead of ratio. Okay, so let's do some quick examples. How many siblings do you have? Is that continuous, discrete, or categorical? And let's not get picky here with step and half and all that. All right, one vote for discrete. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you. Keep answering like this because we're just going to waste time if you don't. So I like when people answer. Yes, this one is discrete and it's technically ratio because you can have zero, but you can't have like a fourth of a sibling and let's not get picky with half siblings. Any only children in here? <gasps> Me too. <laughs> I am a very rare Latina only child. <laughs> okay, how about this one? What level of measurement? We have a Likert scale, Likert scale, nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. <laughs> You're both right. Okay, right, so it's technically ordinal, but treated as interval, and in this case, it's discrete, because it's gonna be in the background, whenever you take like a survey, it's coded in the background as like zero, one, or I should say one, two, three, four, five, rather than these words. We don't want to work with those words, so we code them into numbers. IQ test, what level of measurement? Nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio? This is what an IQ test distribution looks like, by the way, and we're gonna talk a lot, get used to this lovely curve. 
Very good, interval. I did tell you all that. Now, is it continuous, discrete, or excuse me, categorical? Well, we know it's not categorical, but. And I don't expect you necessarily to know this, but throw me some guesses. You think it's continuous or discrete? I don't expect you to know this because you don't know how IQ tests necessarily work. Good guesses. Um, so it's technically discrete because it's just the way that they're reported. You don't have 100.2, it's just whole numbers. And those are called integers. And we are going to need to know that when we're doing some R stuff, integer versus numeric, which we'll talk about um, on Monday. I mean, Monday, on Tuesday. I don't work on Monday. Well, not for this class. Answers. All right, reaction time. A stimulus, like a tone, is delivered, and a person responds. So it's like, boop, and then they have to like click a button after that time beep. So nominal, ordinal, interval, or ratio. We're measuring the number of seconds from a certain time point. I'm waiting. Continuous is correct. We'll give you that. A lot of people are saying interval. I'm curious about that. And I have a couple people saying ratio. Could you get zero? So in this instance, <laughs> the person could be deaf, right? They could not respond. But uh, in this instance, I'm not saying like from the beginning of all random time or from 2020, but in this case, this zero, even though it's like arbitrarily set by me maybe, it is relevant. This is a real zero. So like if they took no time at all to hit their response button, it would be like zero or one. But that is also not possible. Fun fact, before you, like me here scratching my face, before I even had the conscious thought to scratch my face, my brain was already making that decision 200 milliseconds before I did. Is there such a thing as free will? Do you really control your own brain? Neuroscience. So there is a true zero in this case because it's a from a certain time point, you're starting at zero. This is ratio and it's continuous because you can technically have you know, that many milliseconds. And again, for your quiz, I believe there's not gonna be crazy ambiguity like this. It should be hopefully fairly obvious. Megan, you said something? I cannot hear. Did you say something? Um, what the hell, again? No, it's me. This happened last time too. For some reason, I cannot hear out of my speakers. Okay. My other mic that I hope sounds better. So ordinal, remember, is just putting things in order, but the time between them or the the distance between tallest person to next tallest person is not going to be the exact same as the next, the difference between the next two people. So a foot is an interval thing, or it's actually ratio, but like a foot is exactly the same foot for everything, for everybody. But the diff, that's not a good example. The difference between them is either set, like interval, that they have equal little spacings, equal intervals, or an ordinal, it's just they're in order, but they do not have the same amount of difference between them. Hope that helps a little bit, but if not, hang out with me after class and I'll give you a thousand more examples. Okay, and thank you, Emma, for pointing that out to me. If that ever happens again, let me know. Okay, good. Oh, no. Two minutes, yeah! So up next, we are gonna start describing data. Oh my God, I totally thought that's what we were doing today. We're going to describe some data, and if anybody is feeling zealous, you can play with a little bit of this. There's also the R file that says functions from the PowerPoints. Every time that you see some RE stuff at the very end of a PowerPoint, all of this code is going to be in that file. So you don't have to necessarily copy it all, and so you can see it better, and it's already kind of there typed for you, so you can play with it. So encourage you to play with that a little bit if you want to. You're not required to. I'm going to go through all this Tuesday. Tuesday is our hour, our day. <laughs> all right. Do not forget about your quiz. Please enjoy yourselves. Go have a nice weekend. Always a pleasure. And I will see you all on Tuesday. Hang out with me if you want. I'm going to be here till 6. <laughs>